you know, I think I felt unsafe for my entire life, you know, up until I guess, you know, I hit almost 50. I think I had to be broken so I could be used. I'm Stan Bertolo, and this is Back in America. Today, I host Hilary Porter, a leading mindset expert and life architect who helps people design a career and life they love. She combines neuroscience-based mindset coaching to shatter the mental limits and provide strategy and a framework for an epic life. Hilary travels across the globe, not only speaking on stages, both domestically and internationally, but also where she helped Fortune 500 CEOs, professional motorsport, as well as pro sport, think Formula One driver, NFL, to level up and become unstoppable. However, life hasn't always been easy for Hilary. She went through some very dark times, but that's where she learned the power of resilience and choice and has turned her loss into leverage. Welcome to Back in America, Hilary. Thanks so much, Dan. I certainly appreciate it. So I read on your website that you rewire people's mind to help them change and grow. What exactly do you do? <laughs> I know, you know, I get that question all the time. Really, I, I get to teach my clients uh, and really walk with them. Um, on the, I really how to harness the power of the mind. I am a, an advanced psych K practitioner. What we do is we go in and reprogram actually the belief that's been limiting, um, and give it a new belief, one that will serve and create, you know, a limitless and an unstoppable mind, you know, not only help kind of reset, recalibrate, it's kind of like updating, um, an app on your phone, right? It fixes all the bugs and then it, you know, it operates really smoothly. So that's, um, that's what we do. And then we also give them a strategy and a framework uh, and really kind of help them carry that through so they can live like a, you know, a, again, more of a, let's 10X your life, man, in all ways. Well, now let's rewind to your early days. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell me about your childhood, your parents, your sibling, if you have any where did you grow up? You know, what was it like to be a 10-year-old Hillary? Oh, my. Okay. Well, <laughs> um, you know, I'm just a girl who, I came from Tennessee. Um, and obviously, the very Southern still. You can kind of hear some some of the accents still left in my, in, in my voice. Um, I grew up on a farm, actually. Uh, riding my horse, exploring that world. Um, you know, on the outside, Gosh, Dan, it looked absolutely phenomenal, right? You know, big farm, horses really, you know, just travel a lot, doing, you know, really great things. I guess it was kind of like the country club life on the outside. <laughs> but on the inside, it was anything but, you know, truthfully. I, um, my father was really successful, traveled a lot. He had, he was a venture capitalist and, you know, very entrepreneurial. My mother, um, beautiful but extremely disturbed. She was diagnosed with bipolar. And, um, you know, my brother, he was, um, he was a drug addict actually. And he, I mean, he had just issues after issues, you know, there was always something, some calamity going on you know, in the, in the home. And so, uh, while it looked really pretty on the outside, it was anything, but, you know, I was also, I was, uh, had abuse. I suffered, you know, molestation early and from a, a family member, an extended family member. And, you know, I grew up very performance based, you know, we had to dress for dinner at certain times. We had, you know, we entertained a lot. So it was, it was one of those things that, like I said, it looked very good on the outside, but there was a lot of, you know, a lot of darkness on the inside. Um, you know, I never felt, uh, enough, you know, because when you grow up performance based, right, you you have these things, and you and you you seem to um, look for love in all the wrong places, right? Mm. You know, anything just just so you can belong, so you can feel something. I mean, you know, I think I felt unsafe for my entire life. You know, up until I guess you know I hit almost fifty, and so yeah. But okay, so I say all these things, but the reality is. You know, I, I wouldn't change a thing because, again, it forced me to dig deep, kind of pull back the curtain and get really raw. And, and it makes you develop grit. I mean, 
I come from a corporate background. I mean, I it's all so, so tied into mindset. I think that's why I do what I do now because, you know, in the end, I really, I worked my ass off. I'm not going to lie. I worked my ass off. I climbed that corporate ladder. Um, you know, within four years, I made SVP. I was managing like Harvard MBAs. And even though I didn't even have my own degree at the time, I, I had grit. I had determination. Um, you know, now I could have limited myself and said, oh, God, you know, I'll never be an SVP. I don't have that degree, you know, all that kind of thing. Um, but again, it's it's what you believe and, and how you act upon that. Yeah, we, we, we are going to get to that in a minute, Hilary. Let, let's stay a bit longer, uh, you know, at that time uh, in Tennessee. You, you said you, you got abused, you know, at a young age. How old were you and who was it? Um, I would rather not say just protect the family member, um, but it was it started at six and it went on until about 12. With and the same person? Or? Yes. Mm hmm. And you said okay. you were looking for love at the wrong place. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I think then, and I think it's probably a fairly common uh, thing with people who have had, you know, sexual abuse that, you know, you're, you're filled full of shame. You live, you know, from such a place of shame that you never feel worthy. You never feel enough, um, you know, because you have this quite little dirty little secret, right? And, um, you know, and I, and I think, again, you know, looking, you know, now looking back and kind of connecting some of the dots, you know, I see how that pattern, again, made me choose. Actually, it made me choose, you know, my, my husband, hmm. my, you know, uh, my first husband. And, um, yeah, and and that ended very badly. <laughs> yeah, we, we are go also going to talk about that in a minute. But uh, so that, that first abuse, where you, did you get any help or did you deal with it on your own? Oh, no, no, no. Uh, okay, so I didn't get help until I was actually in college. I went to um, a psychologist who then recommended me go to a psychiatrist to get some medication because that's the way it worked back then. Um, and so, unfortunately, during one of our sessions, you know, we were talking about the abuse that had happened, and he actually... Um, he made a pass at me and I just, and that was it. And again, it kind of reinforced, I was thinking that that must be in the, all that I would be worth. That, um, yeah, it was, it was really, um, you know, and I just didn't want to go back and mm -hmm. I didn't want to deal with having to explain that to my parents because then they would think, Hmm, what are you doing? You yeah, know, yeah. <laughs> all that kind of thing. Are you being provocative? Are you whatever? Of course I was not. I was just trying to get help. I was trying to, you know, make sense of it all. Um, so that was it. <laughs> yeah, that didn't help very really much. Yeah, it didn't help. And so I, I read that you went through a very tough divorce. Um, yes, I did. You know, um, I was married for 17 years, and I would love to say it was like the kind of, you know, that was in the magazine, but the truth was it was not. Um, I, I married, I was, I was later to get married. I, a lot of my friends had already been married. I was in corporate, you know, and I was fine, but... Um, I was almost 27 and, and I met this man. I was getting ready to go to Italy to, to go work. And my girlfriend said the very last minute, hey, let's go to the beach. And so, okay, we went to the beach one last time because I was getting ready to leave. And um, I actually met him at the beach and, you know, just thought he was just fantastic and romantic and, you know, all these things. And, uh, yeah, it was just the weirdest thing. So it was a whirlwind, you know, uh, romance, to be to be honest. And, you know, it had never been really, um, I guess, I guess uh, wooed <laughs> like that, right? And so, you know, it was, uh, it was both flattering and exciting and, you know, made me feel all the things that I'd always wanted to feel. Uh, and so I didn't go to Italy and I ended up moving down. He had one semester of college to go left and moved, uh, down to be with him and start our new life. And so we married within a year. So, you know, it, uh, there was a lot of lessons there. I mean, just an enormous amount of lessons. So we both did consulting. So we were on the road for years. Um, so we didn't have the normal kind of foundational, uh, 
that was really strong. And so it was kind of, we just traded information, which I think happens a lot in, in some marriages. Was he also an abuser? Yes. Uh, yes, he was actually. We, um, we had, we had a lot of, a lot of issues. And, and again, as you said earlier on, it's very classic, right? For someone who's been abused to end up marrying an abuser. Yes. And, and, you know, you, you play from a baseline of shame, right? And so you think and you take it on yourself. You're like, there just must be something so inherently flawed with me that, you know, not only I had this happen and grew up, and then, of course, I'm in this relationship now. Um, and so, again, it turned into a really high-conflict divorce, um, you know, and it was just really very challenging. So, And I read somewhere that, on some of the days you felt that the fetal position was the best choice for you. What, what do you mean by that? Yes, it was true. I, you know, I think that um, everybody that goes through a, a period of separation and divorce, there's that kind of the, oh, shit, now what? You know, I've dedicated 17 years. I tried to do everything right, you know, um, and and honor someone that was really dishonorable at the time. And um, then you you think you're, you're overwhelmed and you're kind of swallowed whole with, you know, this is, everything is new. You know, I'm suddenly now an outcast. I'm divorced. You know, um, you have to start over. You have this stigma around you, you know, even in the church, you know, um, I mean, I had crazy experiences that, yeah, people didn't even want me to sit next to their husbands. <laughs> church because I was divorced it's ridiculous but you know it there, there was just so much new and so much going on and because it was such a high conflict divorce you know I was sitting there trying to normalize the children and you know do the best I can but I, you know I was faced with what do I go back to corporate and there's always a price tag with that you know while you make fantastic money right um you know that's also an 80 hour at least a week commitment travel so then I wouldn't be able to see my children. So there's, you know, all this kind of, who are you now? You know, because your identity was wrapped up, um, you know, in being married and, you know, having this unit and, you know, friends and, you know, just community wise and everything else. So everything was new and it just comes at you really hard at times. And especially if there's a lot of infidelity, which is what I dealt with, um, you know, there's that component as well that goes back to that. Well, you were just really not enough. Hmm. Yeah. So there was, a, there was a lot of voices in my head that were going on at the time, Stan, and, you know, you do, you find yourself in that fetal position. And, and you know, the truth is, is I, and I'm not going to lie, there were times that I wanted to end it. I mean, totally. You know, I thought, oh, my gosh, if I would, this, it's just so painful, sure. it's extremely painful. You think, if I if I could just end it, maybe the kids would get the insurance money and then they would be all right. <laughs> so so talk, talk to me about your kids. How old? Where at the time? At the time, um, my youngest was one and a half, and my oldest was ten, ten and a half. Gosh, did you? Did anybody help you at the time? You know, I was involved with church. I used to run a women's ministry and did a lot of uh, nonprofit as well. You become a different person when something like that happens. I mean, you really do. You obsess. You ruminate. You. Um, it's just so engulfing, you know, and especially if it's if it's not an amicable one. And so uh, you tend to uh, lose some that were not really true friends. And so, you know, you have to mourn some of the loss of that during that time as well. And so you feel even more isolated. But uh, to get to your point, yes, I absolutely had, you know, some support. But the longer that it goes on, the support lessens, mm -hmm. you know. Because of it's just exhausting. It's exhausting for you. It's exhausting for your friends because they, they hate to see you in this spot. They don't know what to do. And really at the time, there's you just have to go through it. And you know? how long did that last? Oh, my goodness. Um, in North Carolina, our law dictates that um, we are separated uh, physically for a year before you can even begin to file for the divorce period. So there was a year of just torture, um, you know, on top of just uncertainty and all this stuff like that. And then um, it took about another mm, eight months, I think, 
don't quote me on that, but I think it was, you know, and that, so it's almost two year process, you know, by the time that we got everything, you know, worked out, but it was back and forth. So here you are, you've been abused as a child. Yes. You try to seek help from a psychologist when you were in college and so that the guy was, you know, hitting on you. Yep. You got married from what you thought was going to be a very romantic old marriage turned out to be an abusive situation from which you are fighting a divorce. You find yourself recluse, uh, sort of outcast by, uh, by the church, by your community. How did you manage to go through that? I had a conversation with my daddy, and he looked at me one day and he said, I think you've forgotten who you are. I don't know. It was just like a Mack truck hitting me all at once. Initially, I felt embarrassed, right? Because I turned into this completely opposite person than I was. I was, that was like a, I would apologize, you know, if I ran into the table, <laughs> I would apologize to the table. You know, everything was, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry for breathing, you know? So I went from that because I was a really strong in corporate, right? I mean, you know, who does that? Who goes, you know, from zero to 60 in four years, you know, to SVP level and around the world and managing, you know, million dollar initiatives. So, I mean, I, I went from being this strong woman to just this sniffle and whiny. He was like, listen, girl, you know, kind of find yourself. This is, this is not who you are. And it was the wake up call, I think, because I was, he was dead on. I had forgotten who I was. And I think that's very common when you go through, you know, some kind of traumatic event, you really forget who you are. And sometimes for the, for many of them, you know, many people, I believe that you might not even know who you were to begin with. So many people fall into, you know, they fall into school, they fall into a career, they fall into love and marriage and children and without even blinking an eye. And then they're like, wait a minute, this is just, this is not, it doesn't feel right. You know? So I I think this is really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And and so how did you act on that? Well, okay. So um, since I did consulting for all those years, I, you know, my mind is, it naturally goes to strategy, right? And so I had also been really devouring. Um, I'm a voracious reader. And so I was really looking into psychology. I mean, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy. I mean, I was looking into EFT. I was looking into neuroscience. I mean, I've spent the last 10 years doing a serious deep dive. I really had to go back and find myself first. And so I threw kind of everything I knew from a cognitive and a neuroscience standpoint mixed with (laughs) my strategy and said, okay, let's get on a whiteboard here. Let's go into a war room and let's figure this out. <laughs> and so I, I hate to say it. I kind of, I, I put myself in what I would put myself in my client seat. Mm-hmm. And I just, you know, I, I really figured it out, I figured out who I was, what my strengths were, you know, what my weaknesses were, what the opportunities I had before me, what were the things that derailed me, you know, and how to mitigate that. And then what I really wanted. And so I architected it very carefully. And so I rebuilt I, you know, discovered for the very first time really who I was. And it was a beautiful journey. Um, Which lasted? Ah, it, uh, it, that lasted not, it was actually really quick. It was about a um, couple of months. Cause I mean, when I, I deep dived, <laughs> you know, just really, I dived in. And so once I, once I had all the clarity, right. And I knew who I was, I knew, you know, what my non-negotiables were. I knew where I wanted to go, what I wanted to do. Then I just executed, you know, going back to my consultative years, I was able to execute, right? And, you know, I planned my work and I worked my plan. And that, that's what triggered all your research, your reading, your uh, rewiring yourself, right? It really did. Yeah. And that sort of brings us to where you are today, isn't it? It, Yeah. (laughs) So tell me, how does your own experience, you know, where do you see the 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 match between what happened to you and and whom you've become today oh wow okay so i think and, and i say this often i think i had to be broken so i could be used and because you in order to really serve well and serve deep you really have to have experienced it looking at that like being pissed off is not a strategy right <laughs> 
It's just not. And so coming from that place, you know, I know it well. And I know the frustrations. I know the fear, right? So I think that that's one of the other reasons that a lot of my clients, they, while they might not know my story all the way, they know instinctively that I see them, you know, and that I am for them. And that I will, I'm a, in the foxhole girl, man, I will, will do everything I possibly can to ensure, you know, that not only that they gain clarity, but that they do have a strategy and framework so that they can, they can quickly learn how to pivot and recalibrate themselves. So talk about your work a little bit. How, what are the key steps? You know, to, to me, it's still pretty vague. Reprogramming, rewiring. It looks like you are doing computer programming and we know that the mind is way more complex than a computer. So, you know, what are the steps? What does it mean to reprogram someone? Well, okay, so here's the deal. You have to understand that there's not just one specific kind of client that I have, right? I mean, I get to work in so many different kinds of ecosystems, so every day is very different. This is why um, learning the mind and having, because everybody has all the, con there's you know these commonalities that we share, right? It's so funny because um, a lot of the work that I do with the, you know, C-levels of organizations, I mean, in Fortune 500 and, you know, they're, they're human, you know, I think people forget because they have this big title, right? Or, you know, they're in the NFL, right? Mm -hmm. Or I, I deal with film and, you know, producers and actors and, you know, I, I get to play in a lot of different ecosystems. And because of that, some people think because of their titles that they have it all together, right? Right. But there's more imposter syndrome going on than you wouldn't believe. And there's people that are, that like me, that kind of bought into the lies and created this identity for themselves that, you know, that it's really holding them back. Mm -hmm. And so when I say I want to shatter those mental, you know, things that limit you, I really do. I really want to, to get in there and do that because a lot of times um, when I'll get people, you know, they've been in therapy for years. I mean, which a couple of things, I, and, and I want to say this first, I have the utmost respect for therapists and, you know, what they're trying to do. Cause I think that they are, the majority have been hurt before, so they understand. So that's why they, they go into that field. They really want to help, right? Mm -hmm. The majority of them, and I know several of them actually, several of them have been my clients who have actually transitioned from therapist to coach. I have, you know, that, that part as well. And, but what happens is, is it creates deeper rights the longer you stay in. And so, you know, I'm not one that is going to be promotive of, you know, hey, let's revisit this and let's stay in the same place. And, you know, what is it? Albert Einstein said, you know, doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different, you know, result is just insanity. And I totally believe that. And so everybody has different things that limit them. I have, you know, from drivers to CEOs. I mean, everybody's got something that scares you, that keeps you playing small. I mean, like I said, I could have so easily said, oh, because I don't have a degree, I'm not going to ever be able to, you know, be successful in corporate America. How do you find what the trigger might be? You know, um, I guess in truth, I've been doing this so long. I mean, and I love people and I just love to hear the stories. I love to, I can see patterns and trends real quickly. Some of the people have been told so long oh well you'll always have this or it has to be this way or this is the way you know that it, it is because it's been in your family for so long and it's just so incorrect right and but I do think people are more afraid to really look at different modalities but it's a quick you know look, why not try it I mean yeah. listen I've been in therapy for this and that for so many long times they'll say and they've never been a helper let's just try this. And then, you know, in 15 minutes, boom, 20 minutes, they're like, oh, what in the world? <laughs> <Hold on. laughs> That's fantastic. It is. It's, it brings me a lot of joy to be able to, again, kind of walk in that sacred space, but to hold their hand while they're doing, you know, that, um, you know, that transformation and that letting go. There's this, uh, there's a beautiful part of letting go and surrendering. I started introducing you saying that you spoke at conference internationally, locally and internationally. What do you speak about? 
you know, I speak on a lot of different topics, but um, most recently, I mean, everything from the DNA of a servant leader to this CEO mindset. Um, and that's not necessarily just for CEOs, right? Because most people don't realize that they're the CEO of themselves and of their family and of their community of, you know, wherever they are, they're really the CEO. So um, I talk also about being wrecked to redeemed. Um, I mean, I give lots of different talks. I am actually holding an event upcoming uh, in May, May 1st and 2nd, in the Cape area, Cape Cod, and it's called Unstoppable. Hmm. So we talk about being limitless and, you know, unstoppable and what that really looks like and how to flip your script. So, Well, you definitely look unstoppable to me. Uh We, we are getting at the end of this interview, and I still want to ask you a, a few questions. Sure. I realize that as you were going through all that tough time, uh, you were able to build a, a network of women that have helped you, and that you still cherish that relationship that you've built over the years. Can you tell me you know, how important it is for you, a successful businesswoman, to have that support group? Well, okay, so I'm just going to say that this is one thing that I teach all my clients. It's the importance of tribe, okay? And, and it's really the importance of picking your tribe well because you're always going to play to the, the weakest length, truly. And so you really have to surround yourself, you know, not only by like-minded people, but people that are actually, that, that can, um, iron sharpens iron, right? And so you want to continually be champions for each other and to grow each other. So that's really important to get that tribe more than anything. So how do you do it, right? And that's one of the questions that, that always comes up is like, how the hell do you get a tribe? Because, you know, I, I may be outgrowing my tribe, right? Because that, that's a possibility that happens a lot. Or, you know, maybe, you know, as as more vulnerable and courageous as you become and, you know, own yourself and step fully into yourself, it makes everybody else uncomfortable in your tribe because it forces them to have to, you know, do that kind of deep under the hood work, right? Mm -hmm. So finding your tribe is really critical. And so you, there are different places to, to try to find it. Obviously there's everything from, you know, clubs and organizations, there's, you know, religious organizations, you know, there's all kinds of different ways, professional, you know, networking groups, even you can find your people, you know, in different, different spots, because it's really critical. And um, you'll know it when you find it. I know this sounds crazy, but, it, you know, even I guess it's been a, a little over a year ago, I built um, a closed Facebook group. And it was for life after divorce, man. You know, God called me to do that. And I was like, I don't want to do this. I've got a busy practice. And you know, he's like, no, I'm, you, you've got to teach people how to rebuild, reinvent and reemerge. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and so I was kind of a reluctant leader. In it, but I'm so glad I did because within the first 45 days, we ended up having 1,500 people globally. I mean, from about eight countries represented in this closed Facebook group. And we had like 20 some thousand posts. Wow. So you can see yeah. that there was yeah action and, and fellowship and, and, and true sisterhood, it's really just birthed so many beautiful friendships, deep friendships, and people fly to see each other. And it's, I mean, it's really just very unique. And so, yeah, it grows. It's so funny. It just keeps on growing every day. So do you believe that for a woman to be successful in today's business world, women have to surround themselves with other women? Yes. I do, you know, and, and also, and not just with women, but I think one of the things that I think I've really been noticing, and, and I'm going to stand really firm on this, is I think that the more honest and vulnerable and courageous you are, and that you step into yourself fully, you'll draw the people that you need, mm -hmm. that can build you. And because those are the people that you can do real with, you know, and, and we help lift each other whether it be a man or a woman, I have amazing friendships with men that, you know, they're just like, uh, they're like a family now. Right. And, you know, they've been clients and they've turned into family and, you know, you should see my house around Thanksgiving. <laughs> it's just insane. So, you know, it is, I think it's, it's very important to, to do that. I think one of the, the biggest takeaways, I guess I want everybody to understand is that 
you have to be so intentional, not only about how you architect your life, but and to learn yourself, right? I guess that's the very first thing. Learn yourself. Mm-hmm. I mean, Socrates said it. Learn thyself, right? You just have to learn yourself. Once you learn yourself, you have clarity. Then you got to learn who you want to be around, because again, you're gonna you're gonna take the pieces from that, and you're gonna it's gonna help build you as well. Okay. So after you do that, you know, then you can go out and, and just serve the world with all of that, and that really helps. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Very interesting. One question I always like to ask is, do you have any books or movies or even TV series that you would recommend? Oh, yeah. Okay. So one of my favorite uh, series is on Netflix, and it's called The Kindness Diaries. And I don't know if you've ever seen it or not, but if you have not, I, I highly recommend this. I make all my clients um, watch it. And it's I'm, I'm not going to be a spoiler. I just want you all to look it up. And there's two seasons, and they're absolutely fantastic. I will say that another one of the books that I recommend is by Andy Andrews, and it's called The Noticer. It teaches you how to to notice and to look around and and what how you can show up. Well, thank you for sharing your story. It has been amazing. It's been enlightening. Thank you so much. Thank you. I certainly appreciate it. Thank you for listening. Back in America started two months ago as a podcast of interviews that question the way we understand America. I have recorded 13 episodes that have been downloaded over a thousand times already. If you enjoy this podcast, please help others discover it. Talk about it with your friends. Go to your podcast app and share it on your social media profiles. Do you know people that aren't yet listening to podcasts? Make it your mission to convert them. Believe me, they will forever thank you for it. Finally, I would love to hear from you. Send me a DM on Twitter at Bertolo or an email at Bertolo at gmail.com. And that's B-E-R-T-E-L-O-T at gmail.com. Thank you and see you next week.